Yo dudes, what's up? This was supposed to just be a quick 5 minute review of Monster Boy in the Cursed Kingdom with the briefest of brief mentions of the Wonder Boy games. But the problem is see, I bloody loved the Wonder Boy games and once I started waxing lyrical about them, I found it hard to stop. And before I knew it, my little 5 minute project has ballooned into something far far bigger. I'd originally planned on releasing a short video with my thoughts on Monster Boy back when the game very first released on consoles at the end of last year. But being the lazy idiot hole what I am, it just never happened. Now though, with the delayed PC version of the game finally seeing a release last month and hopefully with it a resurgence of interest in the game, it seemed as good a time as any to commit my brain wafflings about this excellent game and the wonderful series it's based on to video. So get your legendary boots on and let's get down to business. My introduction to Wonder Boy 3 came about through the very first issue of the UK's first ever dedicated Sega only magazine, S the Sega Mag, which came out in October 1989. It was the big game of the issue and it received a glowing four page review. I'd encountered the first Wonder Boy game a few times in the arcade but I'd never actually pumped any cash into the machine, as quite frankly I didn't think it looked that good and there were other far more impressive games in the arcade back then that I wanted to save all my 10 ps to play on. So despite the rather glowing review that S the Sega Mag gave Wonder Boy 3, it wasn't something that I'd planned on going out and buying, because in my brain I just pictured it as being more of the same. I was all about the arcade conversions back then, and I already had a mental checklist of which games were my priorities, and at that point Wonder Boy 3 wasn't even a contender. I already had R-Type and Space Harrier, second hand, courtesy of a couple of spoilt little gits who lived down the street who jumped ship from the Sega Master System to an imported PC Engine. I also had Shinobi which I got with the console itself, and the next games on my immediate horizon were going to either be Outrun or Afterburner. Now your average Master System cartridge back then cost around the £25 to £30 mark, which probably doesn't sound like all that much to your average teenager today. But back when your pocket money amounted to about £3 to £4 a week, that felt like a small fortune. This meant that you really didn't want to accidentally spend that long saved up pocket money or birthday money on a game that turned out to be an absolute stinker and then getting stuck with it for the next six months or so until you could afford to get another one. When my next birthday came about, I headed down to the game shop and disaster upon disaster, there were no afterburner or outrun carts on the shelves and nothing I particularly recognised or desperately wanted. But my eyes did eventually lock onto the case of something I did recognise, Wonder Boy 3. So not wanting to go home empty handed and recalling that S the Sega Mag said it was pretty good, I decided to give it a try and hope for the best. And man oh man, I'm so incredibly glad I did, otherwise I would have missed out on one of the best games ever, and the game that went on to become my favourite Master System game of all time. To this very day it still remains one of my favourite games ever. As soon as I got the game home, slapped the cartridge into the console and powered it up, I knew I was in for something special. The graphics were bold and colourful with large and well animated sprites and detailed and colourful backgrounds. The music was catchy in that chip tune sort of way, with great sound effects as you defeat foes and collect coins from them. The controls were intuitive, with Wonder Boy himself feeling very responsive with a slight feeling of inertia to the character once you started moving, as in when moving left or right, you didn't come to an immediate stop once you took your thumb off the D-pad. A play mechanic that seasoned Mario players were probably used to, but something that was new to me at the time. The game actually picks up right at the end of the previous game, Wonder Boy in Monsterland, a game I have, I'm ashamed to say, still to this day, only had the most cursory of goes on, with Wonder Boy tracking down the final boss of that game, the Mecha Dragon.
Upon defeating the Mecha Dragon, Wonder Boy becomes cursed and transformed into a fire-breathing lizard man, and must then spend the rest of the game tracking down other dragon bosses to undo the curse, with each one turning Wonder Boy into a different animal type with a unique ability that unlocks new areas in the game. So as I've already mentioned, the game looked and sounded great, but best of all was the way it played, with the whole thing feeling like one big open world, with new areas becoming accessible by acquiring the aforementioned new animal forms once you defeated one of the dragon bosses, or by acquiring new items that would let you access previously inaccessible areas. Whilst this Metroidvania style of open world and progression is nothing new nowadays, back then this was a style of platform game I'd never encountered before. Up until that point, I'd only ever played platformer games where you steadily go from left to right in a more or less linear fashion, with each area divided up into distinct stages that you clear and then never return to. Also, by adding in some RPG type elements, such as using money obtained from defeated foes to purchase new weapons, armour and shields, along with magic and potions, the game continued to provide a unique experience that was unlike anything I'd previously played before. The game kept me entertained for the entire summer after I bought it, and finally completing it after getting stuck in the demo dragon's lair for what felt like ages, provided me with a massive sense of satisfaction. Several years later, I traded in my Sega Master System and upgraded to the Sega Mega Drive not long after it was first released in Europe, and a year or two after that, it too got its own Wonder Boy title, so naturally, of course, I purchased it. I was more than happy to discover that it was just as good as its predecessor, with the benefit of improved 16-bit graphics and sound in a considerably larger game world. Whereas the Dragon's Trap had had one central village, Wonder Boy and Monster World now included several satellite villages outside the central one that led to other areas, with the main central village from the Dragon's Trap being replaced by a large castle. Both the castle and the satellite villages included NPC characters you'd need to talk to to progress your quest further, some of which would actually accompany you and provide assistance in getting through certain areas. The little baby dragon guy was my personal favourite. There are now no longer different animal forms for your main character to change into, and you play as a human throughout named Shion. However, many items let you obtain similar skills to the ones in the previous game, like Poseidon's Trident that lets you swim underwater, and the Pygmy Transformation which lets you squeeze into small places. You can now also wield spears as well as swords. Swords are short range but can be used in conjunction with shields. Spears are longer but require you to press up and mash the attack button to reflect projectiles. This move also damages enemies. Wonder Boy and Monster World never seem to get the same sort of recognition that the Dragon's Trap did which is something I've always found a bit puzzling, as I think it's just as good, if not better. UK gaming bible Mean Machines, despite giving the game a favourable review, thanks to the marvellous playability, described the graphics as not brilliant, and the sound as woefully short of the standards you'd normally expect from the Mega Drive, which I think is incredibly over-harsh. The reviewers also managed to both get the name wrong in their summaries, referring to it as Wonder Boy and Monsterland, which is the name of the second game, not this one, which is the fourth in the series. Or technically the fifth if you include the arcade platform shooter Wonder Boy 3 Monster Layer. I think the graphics are great, with colourful, well-defined sprites and backgrounds that feature some nice parallax scrolling effects, and some pretty large enemies as you progress further into the game. I personally also think the soundtrack's brilliant as well, with some excellent 16-bit versions of the tunes from the Dragon's Trap.
game promised it was to be continued after an incredibly difficult final boss, but this proved not to be the case for those of us in the West. The Japanese market, though, received a follow-up that was set in the Wonder Boy universe of Monster World, but which now featured a female character called Asha as its main protagonist. The game was called Monster World 4. Back in the 16-bit days, I was totally unaware of this game, and it's only through the power of the internet many years later that I found out about it. This, also handily, was around the same time I started to get into emulation, and I managed to track down a ROM that had been unofficially translated from Japanese to English. I was super excited at the thought of playing a new Wonder Boy game, but I have to admit that I didn't enjoy Monster World 4 as much as the previous games. It's not a bad game by any means, and I know a lot of Wonder Boy fans consider it to be the pinnacle of the series. But for me, it just didn't quite live up to the same levels of innovation that the Dragon's Trap and Wonder Boy and Monster World had. The reliance on the Pepelugu character to help solve puzzles and traverse through the game just didn't feel as satisfying as the animal transformations in the Dragon's Trap, or the special items that let you progress in Wonder Boy and Monster World, and in some ways, to me at any rate, the progression felt more linear. I also thought the save points were a bit too sparse and some really quite long levels which meant a huge amount of backtracking if you died. It must be said though that Monster World 4 was a pretty gorgeous looking game, arguably superior looking to Wonder Boy and Monster World, and had some good music too, although personally, again, I preferred the previous game's music. After Monster World 4, I honestly thought that that would be it as far as Wonder Boy's story went, and that the series would be consigned to the annals of obscurity, much like Sega's other Master System mascot, Alex Kidd. When New Super Mario Bros. was released for the Nintendo DS in 2006, I can remember thinking just how incredible it would be if Sega did the same thing with Wonder Boy, bringing back the series with a lick of modern day graphics paint, but thinking it would never happen in a million years. Well, it did take a while, and it happened in a slightly roundabout sort of way, but eventually, near the end of 2018, we finally got a modern day continuation of the Wonder Boy series, Monster Boy and the Cursed Kingdom. I say roundabout sort of way, because initially the game wasn't intended as a Wonder Boy game at all, and actually didn't have any involvement at all from Sega during its initial stages of development. When I first became aware of the project about three or four years ago, its work in progress title was Monster Boy and the Wizard of Booze, and from what I could tell, it seemed to be some sort of spiritual successor to the Wonder Boy games, but not something that had any official connection to the Monster World series. Before even this though, the game had started out in life as a Kickstarter project that went by the name of Flying Hamster 2, Night of the Golden Seed. The game then received another name change in 2015, and The Wizard of Booze became Monster Boy and the Cursed Kingdom. This was after the game's French developers, FDG Games and Game Atelier, received criticism over the use of the word booze in the title, 
because apparently we're all a nation of wet fucking blankets now. Now, in the time after Monster Boy's first announcement, but before the game was officially released in 2018, something else pretty amazing happened if you're a Wonder Boy fan. Another French developer called Lizard Cube only went and remade Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap for current generation consoles and the PC. Man, those Gallic dudes sure love themselves some Wonder Boy. The remake came out in 2017 and featured beautiful looking hand-drawn cartoon style graphics, modern reworking to the game's soundtrack and even a few new bonus areas to boot. The new version also featured some slight control tweaks that took advantage of the fact that you could now play the game with more than two buttons, allowing you to switch magics on the hoop without needing to pause the game first and simplifying their usage by allocating the magic attack to a single button press. Unlike in the first game where you needed to press up and attack at the same time, the game could also be played using the original Sega Master System style graphics, which now benefited from a widescreen 16x9 aspect ratio. The game let you switch between the modern and retro style visuals and music on the fly. Along with the ability to play the original chip tune versions of the soundtrack, or the improved versions you'd get with the Sega Master System's add on FM sound unit, a peripheral that never made it out of Japan. And it is in itself a bit of an oddity that the original SMS version of the Dragon's Trap featured an optional FM soundtrack as the game never got released in Japan. Shocking, I know. One last new addition to the game was the ability to not only play as Wonder Boy, but also Wonder Girl, but pfft, why would you want to do that? Haha, <laughs> just kidding, girls are awesome. As remakes go, it was absolutely fantastic. But you know what's even better than a remake? How about an entire brand spanking new entry into a series? So let's get on to the main focus of the video and talk about Monster Boy itself. Now when it comes to talking about the actual game, I'm going to try and avoid any outright spoilers in my initial musings on it, other than things that you'll probably have already seen in its initial wave of trailers and marketing. As I go on though, I will go into a little bit more explicitly spoilery stuff, but I'm not going to give the whole game away or anything like that. When I get to the spoilery stuff, I'll add some time jump info on screen if you want to go and bypass those bits and go into the game totally fresh. Make sure you come back for the conclusion of the video though. So I downloaded the game for my PS4 within the first week of its release. The development team included one of Wonder Boy's original developers and a co-founder of Westone, the company that produced the original Wonder Boy games back in the Sega 8 and 16-bit days and I think their involvement in the game can really be felt. As soon as I fired it up for the first time, the game just immediately felt right, playing and controlling just like a continuation of the original series, but with the benefit of beautifully hand-drawn graphics that took full advantage of 2019 console hardware. The look of the game is something that FDG put a huge amount of time into, refining and continually improving the graphics over the game's nearly five-year life cycle, and their perfectionism has really paid off. The quality of the finished game here is light years ahead of the game's earlier incarnation as Flying Hamster, which to be honest didn't look a million miles away from the sort of thing you'd find on a mobile phone.
The very first area you encounter in the game is beach themed with floating islands and platforms to navigate, with a reworked version of the classic Dragon's Trap tune Sidecrawler's Dance playing in the background. Just like both the Dragon's Trap and Wonder Boy in Monster World, this beach area also features an underwater area that in true Wonder Boy fashion you won't be able to fully explore properly until later in the game. It was during this early stage of the game that I received my first big surprise, with a specific character from the Monster World series making an appearance. Unbeknown to me when I very first started playing the game, at some point in its development, it had been officially incorporated into the Wonder Boy series. Up until this point, I was still under the impression that it was just a spiritual successor that had somehow got the go-ahead to reuse some of the music and enemy types from the Wonder Boy series. Mind blown! Now to be totally honest with you, when I was playing through this first section of the game, killing the familiar looking crab and fish enemies, listening to the fantastic modern version of the classic sidecrawler's dance, marvelling at the beautifully hand drawn but oh so familiar graphics, the realisation that I was finally getting to play a modern day sequel to one of my favourite game series ever finally started dawning on me and I could actually feel a bit of a lump forming in my throat. Let's just get one thing straight here though, I didn't cry or anything. I'm a 43 year old man for flip's sake, and made a sterner stuff than that. <coughs> the soundtrack was composed by several well known Japanese video game music developers, one of whom was the legendary Yuzo Koshiro, who as you may very well know, was responsible for some truly incredible video game soundtracks back in the Mega Drive days, including such classic titles as Revenge of Shinobi and the Streets of Rage series. In addition to the original score, some rearranged music from past entries in the series was included, some of which was composed by YouTuber Banjo Guy Uli, whose channel I'd highly recommend checking out for some awesome banjoified renditions of old game soundtracks. Ollie himself even manages to make it into the game as an NPC character, who has some musically themed side quests for you to complete. Both the new arrangements of the classic Wonder Boy tunes and the brand new stuff all sound amazing. But Monster Boy doesn't just copy the original Wonder Boy 3 template, it advances the gameplay in crucial ways while still feeling connected to the original series. Much like the Dragon's Trap, progress is made through the game through the acquisition of new animal forms after defeating bosses, and these endow the player with new abilities that allow you to reach previously inaccessible areas of the game world. These aren't just simple rehashes of the animal forms from the Dragon's Trap though, and each manages to feel original in their own right. Additional abilities can be obtained for the animal forms in Monster Boy by collecting talismans for each of the animal forms that you collect as you advance through the game. This adds an extra layer of depth by then allowing you to use these additional abilities to then unlock even more new areas and secrets as you explore the vast game world. Like Wonder Boy and Monster World on the Mega Drive, you'll also need to obtain certain special items, weapons, armour and boots to help you progress through certain otherwise inaccessible areas, for example boots that let you double jump, walk on lava or sink in the water, or weapons that can smash obstructions to certain areas, or that can create platforms allowing you to reach previously inaccessible areas. As you obtain these items and new animal forms, you'll also find yourself backtracking from time to time as well, thinking, I wonder if I can get into that particular bit of the level now. Great stuff. The Dragon's Trap and Wonder Boy and Monster World were games that both had very balanced difficulty levels in my opinion. They started off not too hard, but then gradually got more and more difficult the further through the games you got. Whilst the later levels did get quite challenging, I don't think they ever got so hard as to start causing major frustration. Although, as I previously mentioned, the very final boss in Wonder Boy and Monster World was particularly difficult, but not undoable. In an unusual turn of events though, this boss was actually made much harder for western gamers than Japanese ones, with a moving conveyor belt added that really upped the challenge. Monster Boy follows in a similar vein, with the game gradually easing you in before it starts to get harder. Monster Boy has a far larger game world than any of the Wonder Boy games that came before it. My final total playthrough when I got to the end was close to 36 and a half hours. As such it is generously served with frequent save points that mean if you reach a particularly tough section, you normally don't have to backtrack on yourself too much when you die. Later on in the game there is also a particular item you pick up that does make life a bit easier for you in this regard. 
Likewise, the majority of bosses in the game are not especially difficult to defeat once you pick up on their attack patterns and the very specific thing you need to do to beat them. Which, as an older gamer with crap reflexes who doesn't do very well with extreme difficulty in games anymore, I was very pleased about. There was a noticeable spike in the game's difficulty when I reached a volcano area, but again it never got so hard I ever wanted to rage quit. One thing that is a bit different in Monster Boy compared to the previous Wonder Boy games is a heavier reliance on puzzles that needed to be solved in certain places in order to progress. On the whole I didn't mind this addition too much, but if I were to level just one criticism at the game, there were a few times that some of the puzzle sections started to outstay their welcome a bit. Some of the puzzles that you encounter quite early on in the game, where you play as the frog, involve rotating the whole display area around you to facilitate getting to certain secrets and exits, and they're really quite ingenious. But some of the later ones, in particular some of the volcano puzzles that involved rolling boulders around that were very easy to accidentally smash, just started to feel never ending at a point I just wanted to get on with some regular platform gaming again and start hacking and slashing bad guys. And it did feel like these bits just interrupted the game's flow a little bit for me. As I said earlier though, this really is only a minor quibble, and there were only a couple of times that I found a particular puzzle or entry to a certain area so head scratchingly obscure that I had to check GameFAQs or a YouTube tutorial for a solution. Additionally, once you've solved a puzzle in an area, it stayed solved, so if you'd just completed a particularly arduous section involving shoving blocks around, or trying to jump boulders over lava without smashing them, and then you died like a bit of a spaz straight afterwards, the game would automatically save that bit of progress before returning you to the save point. In the Dragon's Trap, the ability to switch between animal forms on the hoof was an ability you only gained if you were able to track down a special item called the Tasmanian Sword. This item wasn't essential to complete the game, and it is in fact something I didn't know anything about back in the day. The ability to switch between animal forms in Monster Boy though is something that you can do from the off, and rapidly becomes essential as you progress further through the game in order to make progress. Later parts of the game will actually require you to do this at speed whilst traversing through the various parts of the level, lest you face certain death. I mentioned earlier in the video that I was actually quite surprised when I first started to play the game, to find out that it actually turned out to be part of the actual Wonder Boy canon and not just a spiritual sequel. There's information on FDG's Monster Boy development blog about who owns the trademark and IPs for Wonder Boy and Monster World, which I can't really be asked to go into here, but suffice it to say it is an official successor. So with that, let's move on to some spoilery stuff next about some of the links between Monster Boy and the previous Wonder Boy games. I'll add a time up on the screen now that you can jump to in the finished video if you want to bypass this part and go into the game totally unspoiled. I'll give you to the end of the pirate race to be gone if you want to. Still here? Great. So whilst there's obviously a connection between the Monster Boy and Wonder Boy games in terms of music and certain enemy types you encounter, one of the quests later on in the game has you specifically searching for relics lifted directly from the previous games, the Salamander Cross from the Dragon's Trap, the Stone Axe from the very first Wonder Boy game, and the Ocarina from Wonder Boy and Monster World. The sanctuary that you return the items to also has stained glass depictions of the legendary heroes outside it. And later still in the game, you call down directly upon the spiritual strength of the legendary heroes to help light your darkest hour. Just like in Transformers the movie, but without the Orson Welles voiced planet eating monster robot. The Ocarina quest actually transports you to a 16 bit version of Alcedo, the fairy village from Monster World, where you have to play the Ocarina just like in the Mega Drive game, complete with one of the fairies mistaking you for Shion, the blue haired hero from that game. Another puzzle involves a cork dwell in the village, 
When you finally manage to uncork it, you have to solve another puzzle that initially makes it seem like your game's broken. What you actually need to do is destroy all the text on the screen before the progress bar at the bottom vanishes. When you do that, you get transferred to an 8-bit world, where you traverse along a bit of very familiar looking dungeon before facing off against the Mecha Dragon once again. You then get rewarded with a heart container for your troubles. In a later encounter in the game, after facing off against a boss that's very reminiscent of the dragon from Monster World, you then go on to play a side-scrolling shoot-em-up section that pays homage to West Stone's previous platform shooter game, Wonder Boy 3 Monster Layer, right down to the first level boss from that game making a reappearance. This particular boss also reappeared in a slightly shrunk down form, as we saw a bit earlier in the video, in the Mega Drive version of Wonder Boy and Monster World, as one of the enemy types that you encounter in some of the underwater sections. These are all fantastic little touches to an already brilliant game. Another nice touch, which isn't a callback to a specific Wonder Boy game per se, but rather more of an acknowledgement of the game's retro roots, is a part of the Dark World level at the end of the game that transports the hero to a blocky, isometric looking world, that also features another shoot 'em up section at a certain point. There's also a particularly awesome 80s synth sounding version of the last dungeon playing in the background. In a nod, perhaps not to any particular Wonderboy game, but a certain Italian mustachioed plumber, the game features a haunted house level that teams you up with Pepelugu as you go busting ghosts. Yeah, Bustin' makes me feel good. One little thing I would have liked to have seen that didn't happen though, would have been some sort of reappearance of Biomecha, the final boss from Wonder Boy and Monster World, who then also subsequently reappeared as the last boss in Monster World 4. Having had this guy as the big bad in the last two games of the series, I think it just would have been nice if he'd had either a cameo, or was revealed to have been the character who was pulling everyone's strings all along. But FDG decided to go with an entirely original creation for their main baddie. Again, this isn't really any sort of a criticism of the game, just merely an observation. As it stands, when I finished the game, I was at about 89.5% completion. Just from the little bit of extra research I was doing about the game to put this video together, I found out a little something I was not previously aware of. A bonus screen you get if you manage to 100% complete the game. It's a picture that seems to suggest that Asha is actually still alive in the Monster Boy time period, but has somehow been frozen or something, with Pepelugu staring on forlornly. 
Ooh, FDG, you saucy bitches. If you're planning a sequel, I'd be all over that, even if it takes you another four years to complete it. Okay, so let's draw things to a conclusion here. Monster Boy in the Cursed Kingdom is an absolutely beautiful looking 2D platform game that plays like a dream, sounds great and has tons of last ability. If you've never touched a Wonder Boy game in your life, but you're a big fan of stuff like Metroid, Mario or the Castlevania games, you'll still be able to pick up and play it as a brand new title and enjoy the game. If you're someone like me who grew up with these games and still have a lot of nostalgic love for them, you'll absolutely adore it. Monster Boy spent a long time in development because FTG Games and Game Atelier wanted to get it just right, and that devotion to their art really shows. This is a million miles away from so many of the cheap cash-in 2.5D looking platformers that seem to be a dime a dozen at the moment. So should you buy it? Yes. Get it now! You'll love it. While you're at it, get Lizard Cube's fantastic remake of The Dragon's Trap as well, and play that before you play this. So Lizard Cube. When's the remake of Wonder Boy and Monster World coming out then? No, I'm being totally serious. When? 